All right, folks. It's time for buy some jellies. How about some Nidarians, some Tina Fours. Weird names for an overall kind of simple group. Uh, in a way, jellies. Now, I love some jelly, even though I'm much more of a jam fan now these days. I don't even know the difference is. Uh, and I'm okay with that. I do remember when I would always go out to eat, like, for breakfast some places as a kid. Like, I'd always get these little jelly packets and just go to town on them. Just chow down just to eat them. Because I was all hungry. Like, I didn't want to wait for my pancakes to come out or my hash browns. Like, no, man, give me some jam. I just ate some chips that are kind of barbecue-y, and that's starting to back up on me. I can feel it in my mouth, like the bowl, the, the fire burning on me. Um, but yeah, so I've been some jam uh, lately. I've been on a strawberry jam kick that has no end in sight. It's so amazing. Uh, I've eaten more strawberry jam the past month than I probably have my entire life up until this point. That's pretty impressive, I would say. Um, but yeah, let's talk about these Nidarians and Tina Forms. What makes these things so special as an animal group? Let's get at it. And a 200 pack of jellies that you can buy off Amazon? Like, seriously? That's a lot of jelly and jam. Uh, that's a lot. And I no doubt have packets of these stashed somewhere in my apartment in a drawer somewhere, in a pocket or something. From like years ago I kept. I'm like, oh, I'll eat it later. Pfft, what'd you leave there? You don't want to eat that BS anymore. Uh, so, going back to our little tree here. We've seen this before. Uh, based on these different groups. Now we know where we're at. Boom! Nidarians and Tina Falls. Now again, we talked about this recently, Tina Fours may actually be before preference, but we're pretending they're not right now. Uh, for our purposes. What time period are we looking at? Idiot Karen, baby. Idiot Karen, all day, every day. Uh, so this is where these early f soft things first started popping up. It's hard to find fossils for these because they have no hard parts, right? So it can be difficult. So in all likelihood, maybe around a little bit before this time. Uh, before now, that's what we know. So eh, it is what it is. We'll take it. Uh, e. Karen, and they're still alive, right? So they've just been around a long time. A long time. Ah, man, I love sweet tea. Uh, so, the group. Um, these are radiates, so they have radial symmetry. And this is phylum and area. So this has the hydra, jellies, anemones, corals. Very different organisms if you think about them, but, oh, you know, pretty similar. Characterized by, of course, radial symmetry, as you can see here uh, on the pictures. Radial symmetry defines this group. I know what you're thinking. How many germ layers these things got? Well, you can have one, you can have two, you can have three. These puppies, they got two! Uh, and then, of course, they're missing the mesoderm. So you have ecto and endo. So they have a, an internal thing called the gastrodermis and the outer layer of the, of the, of the epidermis. Um, so there's this little gelatinous mass that exists between them. If you ever touch a jellyfish, it's a nervy experience. Um, you can touch them, it's like, I don't know, it's kind of squishy. It's like jelly. Hence the name. Uh, and so that's there, and they also have a gastrovascular cavity. So this means this is a cavity that helps serve some sort of like, it's just kind of multi-functions, right? They just have this one big overall cavity. Uh, we'll see a picture of it in a second. And then, they have a nervous system. Yeah, that's right. They have feelings. Well, kind of. Uh, and so, you can poke them with the stick. They'll, they'll respond. They have a nerve net. So, they don't have a central nervous system, like a brain or anything. But they have just nerves. So they can go around as they're floating in the ocean. Stumbling across the vast expanse of the Pacific. Or whatever ocean they find themselves in. They bump into something and go, ooh, pardon me. Uh, and they will bump back out of the way. And they can also help find prey this way. Uh, so move around in those sensations. So they have some nerve feelings in that way. Uh, and they can be either fully mobile or sessile. Usually in the jelly life cycle, you have both stages. But in some other ones, you know, maybe just one. And of course, they got some hox genes. Because, I mean, you need a blueprint for that thing. Let me tell you something. Uh, they need it. Okay. So there's about 11,000 species of these things. One of their big characteristics is they can regenerate. And so this is something that's going to be found kind of early on in these groups, but will disappear very quickly as you move up in complexity. But this thing is so simple enough to allow for simple regeneration. Same deal with reproduction, right? Sexual and asexual reproduction. And they have alteration of generations. Boom. You think we left it behind with plants and all that crap? But no. To back again. You can't ex escape the idea of alternation of generations. It's here to stay. It's not really. Uh, but it's there. 
And so this is where you have a polyp stage and a medusa. And the medusa is the one that floats around, it's kind of creepy, and will sting you and bite you. Oh, not really bite you, they don't have teeth, but you know what I mean. Uh, and there's a polyp stage, which is the one that just kind of sits there and plants. And so it just kind of just spits off clones of itself into the existence. And one of the medusa is the one that actually undergoes sexual reproduction and form polyps after that, and then just do their own thing. Uh, so we got those, and there's five groups. You have to know these five groups, right? So make sure you know them. Make sure you know common uh, examples of organisms found in them and their traits. So let's get it. Here's some examples of them. Uh, so this is, you know, night area. You know, you get some creepy, you get some fun, you get some pleasant. Overall, kind of just to start being in a way. But cool. Foundation of Marines. Uh, if you learn anything about Marine, if you're a Marine bio major, oh boy, you're going to learn a lot about some Marine inverts, let me tell you. So looking at the organization, so we looked at periphera, you know, they didn't have nothing, right? No tissues. The Nidarians and Tinafos, both are diploblastic. Uh, the Nidarians do not have a complete gut. That's where that gastrovascular cavity comes into play. See that one opening? Well, that's it. The mouth and anus uh, in one end. The Tinafore, though, I'm more sophisticated. Uh, it's got the mouth end and the anal end there. So, got a whole tube. Meanwhile, jellyfish, that's not how they're the Nidarians, they don't roll that way. Uh, and note, no mesoderm. And they're done the body cavity. Uh, so, here is their different forms. So, there's some of the things you can actually see where the gastrovascular cavity would be. So, that's where food can be taken in. Mouth, anus, combo pack. Uh, the epidermis, gastrodermis layers, so they're two layers that they have. Uh, tentacles, defining trait for this group, they have some tentacles. You can see them in their real life pictures in the diagrams, so not bad. You can see some in lab too, well, pictures of them. So, um, so with Nidarians, they have this basic nervous system. So you can see their neurons are kind of different. They have these bidirectional neurons. Ours usually go in one way. Uh, they have different ways, and the benefit here is they can feel sensations uh, in kind of multiple different directions, and the electrical impulse can travel in any direction. So it's just big, massive, just like firing back and forth to let them kind of know where they're at. But it's, it's pretty simple. It's not overly complicated. But they have bidirectional neurons, so it's very much a unique trait for them. Uh, the big thing that defines this group, though, is the presence of nidocytes. Uh, and so these are used to, well, sting prey and sting things that are just trying to swim in the ocean. Maybe young children are trying to have a good time. You know, first time at the ocean, swimming around, looking for some sand dollars and stuff, and then bam, sting the kid on the back. Because that's what happened to me. Uh, my first time at the ocean, got stung by a jellyfish. And pretty much every time I visited the ocean after that, I was stung by a jellyfish for years. Uh, and that sucked. But I was well averse. Not knowing the terms at the time, but nanocytes were definitely stinging me. Uh, what's cool is not all of them affect humans, but luckily for me, I kept running into the ones that did. I actually have a pretty fond memory of being on a raft inside the ocean. Uh, I was in the Gulf. I was down in Florida. I don't remember where, but it was, oh boy, I was like seven or eight. So I'm looking at 95-ish. That was a long time ago. And I remember looking around when I was on my little raft, and I saw a big glowing mass behind me, and that was a jellyfish. Scared me half to death. I screamed. I jumped off the raft, ran to shore as quick as I could, and didn't go back in the ocean for the rest of the day. And I wish I could say that was the only time that tripped that I screamed and ran to the shore, not going back in the water for the rest of the day. But oh man, another story to come later on because that was not the first time. Uh, but anyway, terror existed in me from a young age of uh, the world around me, but also fascination. But yeah, so these things can pack a punch. Some of them can kill you, and especially smaller animals like fish and stuff, psh, forget about it, dead. And so you can also see the mechanism, they have like a little harpoon thing fire out, and then just pass it on. There's a video coming up. Uh, but here it is, so there's going to be a video, uh, Come, I know I'm one of the, the future slides here, so you can actually get a peek at that thing. Uh, so check that video out. So make sure you check out the video for that, so you can see that thing happening. Uh, it'll be in one of the, the playlists for Nidarians and Tinafore. And so this is an overall mechanism. You have the structure itself, and so then you have like a, a winged little heart attached, and then it fires off, grabs onto the prey, blasts them with venom, and then they'll either die or scream in agony, or feel nothing. So multiple options. Uh, so looking ahead, then what we talked about, and like for all groups really going forward, 
keep up with main characteristics. You know, what defines these groups? What makes them unique uh, compared to each other? That's very important because otherwise, like, this is what you're going to be tested on is like traits unique to these organisms or things they all have in common. You know, like which ones are the bilaterals, which ones are radials, which ones are uh, dipoblastic, which ones have triploblastic. So, all those are the traits. So, keep those in mind. Uh, and again, share derived traits, make us special. So, keep those in mind for all these organisms. Okay, so here's the groups of cnidarians. Uh, we're going to look at them all. Uh, so, anthozoans, we're going to start us off first, then starozoans, skyphozoans, tubozoans, and hydrozoa. It's bum bum bum. And so, you can see their share derived characteristics for this group. So, nidocytes, radial form, have a plain yellow larva. We're going to talk about it, but it's there. Uh, and they have tentacles around their mouth. This is like a great place for tentacles. Kind of wish I had tentacles around my mouth. Uh, if my mustache gets too long, it feels like I have tentacles around my mouth. And that's just kind of weird. I don't like it. Uh, but that's my challenge. And the, and the zones. Our coral friends. Yay! Most people like corals because of coral reefs and cute little fishies and everything. But they're kind of pretty. Uh, and so there's a lot. So a lot of species of this sucker are all marine. So, all found in the water. You can have soft versions or hard versions. The soft are the anemones, um, which is the famously hard word to say in Finding Nemo. I never found it that hard myself, but then again, I'm not an aquatic creature living underneath the ocean trying to speak, which is difficult anyway. Uh, and corals, which are typically more the hard variety, but there are soft corals too, but you know. Eh. Um, but in this group, no Medusa, only polyps. That's something to keep in mind. When looking at these groups of cnidarians, keep up with which ones have both of these stages, which one has either or. That's unique for them. Um, and again, common things. Uh, but symbiosis, right, is very, very common for this group. Uh, they form, you know, best friends with other organisms. So, I mean, famously clownfish, you know, not affected, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah. Next up, the sea anemones themselves. And so with these, they have these tentacles that surround their oral disc. And they just kind of sit on the substrate. And uh, they can glide, actually, on this whole thing. This video, so make sure you watch it. It's hilarious. Uh, they can they can move a little bit, but they're overall pretty sessile. But they can have slight abilities to move. And sometimes you can freak one out and watch it move. It just kind of like dances in the water. It's really weird, but also really cool. We talk a lot of things in science, honestly. Uh, and it can feed on a lot of stuff, including fish. Uh, so some fish are friends. Some fish are food. Uh, for the anemones, it's not just sharks and people that eat fish. Uh, it's all kinds of stuff. Even this weirdo thing. Uh, so at least they'll try to eat the fish. You know, they may not be able to break it down, but they'll give it a shot. It depends, though. So one of the things when you look back at Nemo is, well, you remember this. And so we'll talk about the fish later, later on, but in short, Nemo lied. There's a lot of things wrong with this entire movie. Uh, in addition to the fact that they speak and care about their offspring, but a variety of other problems. I'll make mention that when we talk about fish, because, oh boy, there's some issues with the Nemo. Um, so, in addition, it's decimated clownfish populations, because you have a bunch of kids who want them, and then boom, you have legal harvesting of these things in the oceans, or over-harvesting, and then their populations are going down. So I bet we'd leave the clownfish out there, and if you want your kid to have one, just give him a picture. Or actually take care of the thing, you know, and be nice. Um, you know, like our presentation showed, flush it down the toilet when it's still alive. My God. Because um, you think about it, that thing's still alive. It's a marine organism. You're putting it in fresh toilet water. I think it's going to just suffocate in a way. Like, oh man, that's brutal. Anyway, this video is coming up. So there's three videos featuring uh, anemones and their related actions. Make sure you watch those. Uh, corals. Uh, kind of fun. This is a, there's a brain coral shown there on the top left because it looks like a brain. Ha! Uh, they're hardened in shape compared to the anemones, which are typically a little more soft. They have a photosynthetic dinoflagellate. Remember we talked about those? Way back with protist. Um, but they form the relationship here, so they get energy from these things. Uh, and so this allows them to eat. And so helps them out a whole lot. Nice for them. However, at coral bleachings with the dinoflagellates are like, you know what? I'm bouncing. So good luck with all that. Uh, and the next thing you know, the poor coral's like, oh no, how do I live? You know, I can't live without you. And then they die. Uh, and it's just overall kind of sad. Um, but yeah, it's just, you know, how, how things go. Uh, they'll just 
starve and die because they can't get any food. Just, you don't think about something that looks like a rock starving and dying, but hey, they can do it. Uh, so yeah, not bad. Uh, uh, one thing is it's dealing with coral bleaching because there's a very real concern with changing temperatures in the ocean. Big problem in the modern day is trying to find ways to stop it. Uh, and so some things are harder, some things are easier. One of the things they found was if you remove things that eat and stress corals, it actually helps withstand temperature changes. So this gives hope because it shows we can actually do things on a local management level that actually will help deal with corals from bleaching as temperatures in the ocean continue to rise. Um, and so that's pretty fascinating, honestly. Like, that's very, very cool. And not something you would always expect to see. Um, but nevertheless, it is there. And so, yeah. That's, that's, it's nice to have, you know, some optimism, some hope from time to time. And so you, you can do a difference. And it's weird thing about snails eating corals, too. It seems so unnerving. But some people at Duke found this out. So do what you can. Try and prevent coral, you know, predation, if possible, over predation to help them withstand stress and bleaching. Here's a coral reef. And it's they've usually been called Rainforest of the Sea because they are so pretty and extravagant. And... And they have tons of diversity of life with them. So there's all kinds of unique species that hang out in, the, in these coral areas. So tons of stuff. So they're hot spots of biodiversity. And so that's why they're important to protect is because they have so much diversity in these small areas. Because the ocean is big, but there's a lot of less, like areas where there's not a whole lot happening. Uh, so a ton of species are found here. So they occupy less than like 0.1% of the oceans. But they provide a home for over 25% of all marine species. And there's a ton of global economic benefits we get from coral reefs, raising up into billions and billions of dollars in services. A lot of it just like the tourism. Uh, Great Barrier Reef is a biggie. So that's soccer found in Australia. Uh, luckily, it's in water, so it helps. Uh, this is going away a good bit uh, from, from other issues related to the, the climate. Um, which is unfortunate, but tons of individuals of organisms that live here from cool dolphins to uh, unique uh, turtles, some sea turtles. So there's only a few species of those even left in the world. So those are found that whales can be found here. Fish, sea snakes, which are pretty terrifying, I'm not going to lie. Uh, they're quite venomous usually. Uh, and it's a sea snake. Like, ugh. Cool, but, you know, ugh. Uh, and then, of course, mollusks, so some, some snails and all that sort of stuff. But tons of stuff found here, lots of species. And you can see where it is in the map here in Australia. So if you're ever down there, check Don't get eaten, though. Uh, here's some unique animals found down there. We got dugongs! Uh, so I love a du good dugong. And so here's some major nidarians. Uh, so we're moving on to the next group, Storozoa. These are the stalk jellies. So they do not have a Medusa stage, only polyp. So it's two now that fit that category. Uh, and their sexual reproduction involves a larval form that just kind of crawls along and develops into polyps. So it's kind of weird. They're normally um, cold water, but they can be found in warm water too. Uh, the largest ones are going to be found in northern latitudes where it's colder. I guess deep southern latitudes as well, but more northern, I think. Um, so that's the thing. Sorry, I was getting some tea. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're kind of a neat looking organism. You know, someone can be found in their hydro pool. Uh, but yeah, here's their shape, and they look very odd. You can see why they're called stalk jellies. It looks like they have like a little stalk. To me, it always reminds me of those things. You get like the sticky hands in those little vending machines, like a quarter, and they can throw it and like cling to the wall, but you can hold on to it. This is what that reminds me of. I find it extremely unnerving in different areas. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, like, look at this thing. Like, I feel like it's gonna like attached to my face and then eat me. Uh, which could be a thing, because we look at the movie Predator, or excuse me, Alien. Man, I'm sorry. Look at the movie Alien. This kind of looks like that. We have this long tentacle thing with a long tail coming off of it. And oftentimes, nature inspires horror in movies and cinema. So, very much an inspiration of this sort of thing. Except, these things won't attach to your mouth and inject you with babies that will then burst out of you and then eat and destroy everybody on this spaceship. Or do we know that for sure? Who knows? Maybe we should not test that. Um, disturbing. Well, that's it for Storazoans. Skyfazoans! These
globalization unique to them. We'll talk about that in a minute. But these are the true jellies, the menaces of the sea. Uh, and so, again, very simple organisms uh, in terms of like nervous system and such, tissues, but they still have properties. Lots of these things around uh, can get very big. Uh, so some of their tentacles can just reach for meters and meters in the, in the ocean. So that's why you got to be careful. They have those things all on them. Imagine getting like all that wrapped around you. Ugh. Um, that's terrible. So ocean's scary, y'all. Ocean be scary. Uh, and this one has the Medusa. And in fact, most of it is spent in the Medusa. Apollo. Um, but true jellies, they eat a lot of stuff. And so they are more predators floating around the ocean just looking for stuff. They can eat fish. They can eat crustaceans. They can filter feed. They can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, a variety of ways to actually eat. And so uh, the, usually the digestive system also has stinging cells. So you get sung when you're captured. And then you get dragged into the mouth. And you think, you, oh, well, I'll just burst out of the jellyfish. How thick can that tissue really be? But, oh, wait, you're going to get zapped again, buddy, by the digestive system. So, that's pretty messed up, but also pretty cool. Uh, on the previous slide, we had some Pokemon too. So, Pokemon have inspired a lot of jellyfish. Uh, the ones on the bottom left were like ghost jellyfish, which is weird. Um, this is a common sea turtle, or uh, having the sea turtle. Uh, this is a common jellyfish uh, found around our area, so near Tampa ish. So, if you're out in the oceans in that area, uh, these can be here. The Atlantic sea nettle was on the left side. That's the one that has more of a common sting to it. It's probably the same little jerk that stung me a few times as a child. I was also stung on the Atlantic side too. So, man, no matter what body of water I get into, something's trying to kill me. Uh, but it was there. And the pink meanie on the right side uh, is uh, it's, it's found there too. Even though that one's not as harmful to us really at all. So, <laughs> and the name pink meanie, which is fun. Uh, it's a little bit of a misleading. I'm pretty sure that doesn't hurt us that well. That might. Uh, but another jellyfish you're going to have is the lion's mane jellyfish. Look how big this joker can get. It can get massive. Uh, there's some pretty good videos for it. I got one included in the playlist for this lecture. So make sure you watch that it's joker. They kind of be like floating ecosystems inside the ocean. While other organisms are just hang out. Like this is the party palace. This is the place to be. The party bus. Uh, and so just hang out, you know, flock, live inside this thing, just eat some food, have a good time, just ride it out. Uh, these are cold water, so luckily, you probably won't see one of these things around Florida. Uh, so, yay. But if you go up, way up, you know, or even down near Australia, you may see some of these things uh, along these colder, chillier waters. Um, and then something's going to eat them. So while they're big and creepy and kind of scary, and you're like, ooh, go away, you know, ooh, get away from me. Go freeze up into an ice block and become an ice jelly. Uh, but sea turtles and things can actually eat them, so that's good. If you like sea turtles and fish, well, then you want these things around. They're food sources. Um, they can't sting you, but they usually don't fail, kill you, so that's good. They just have a high number of them, so you don't want to get caught up in that. That'll mess you up. And these live about a year, so a year of fun. And so watch the video for that thing. Because it's an experience not to be missed. This thing's a moon jelly. This thing is uh, actually featured in a commercial for a memory for, for things I see on Jeopardy all the time. I have no idea why it's not explained in any way. I don't know if like, a protein is made on them or something that linked to memory, but of all the things that lead to memory, why would something in the jellyfish be the thing that do it? Like, it doesn't make sense on an initial level. And then again, science is weird, but like, it's just odd to think about something with such a simple nervous system. It's like, oh yeah, that's the secret to a better memory. It's like, can this thing remember anything? Uh, it's weird. But the four horseshoe things, the, the that thing you see up the top uh, on the pictures that kind of define the looks like eyes, that's their gonads. Uh, so reproductive organs found in there. They just kind of float around, do whatever. They don't really sting us, which is cool. So they're found pretty commonly around here. Uh, they're they're kind of neat. They're used in uh, a lot of aquariums. You'll see them things floating around. Moon jelly sounds cool. Well, let's look at their life cycle. And so uh, Aurelia is the genus. And so it, ha it has its Medusa stage that it spends time in. The larval form will grow. And you can see the structures that it forms uh, near the top. So there's some uh, morphological changes that occur from this. Uh, as things get kind of absorbed into it, and so it can bud out and kind of, you know, evolve like a couple things forming, so you can kind of see that there. But then there goes strobilization, which is where they'll form like many different little segments that will then become their own jellyfish medusa. So there's a planula that grows and then kind of clones itself and produces many copies of itself that it floats out in the ocean. Uh, and that shows you that a lot of these things are just going to be food. So most of them. Uh, 
here's a thing from a news story a couple years ago I found, and it's really unusual. So this is a fish inside of a jellyfish, and that fish is not dying. So the thinking is that this is actually a symbiosis of sorts. So like this could be like a part of that, you know, because they have found fish and jellyfish symbiosis before. So like in this case, it may be the fish using the jellyfish as like some sort of protective armor and just swimming around saying, oh, you're going to eat me? I don't think so. Get a mouthful of tentacles instead, Jack. Uh, and there's a, they're actually immune to the, the stinging of the jellyfish, this fish is. Or like just like floating on this like little armor cocoon type thing, so it's pretty sweet. So it's like Iron Man, the fish version, uh, floating around inside of a jellyfish. Which again, that's what you see all the time, of something just going inside and living inside and using the husk of the body of something else. Kind of dark. Also, the, really the kind of the plot of Men in Black 1, where a, a cockroach thing took over the skin of a, of a farmer guy and ran around town terrorizing New York, threatening the world with cockroaches or something. Uh, pretty terrifying, but this is the real life version of that, which is less scary, more scary. I don't know. Fish being that smart is kind of weird. Anyway, let's look at Cuba's Owens. Uh, Alright, box jellies. So there's not as many of these. These are more active hunt, hunting type of jellyfish, which is kind of unnerving. I think about something like this, actively hunting. Uh, but they'll use their tentacles to go around. So the true jellies just kind of float around, just eat whatever they can find. These things will actually go out and more pursue them, uh, which is, again, weird. Uh, they have tentacles that kind of come from like the corners of their shape instead of kind of all around and the venom is extremely dangerous uh, It can even lead to killing of humans So you gotta watch out for these jokers because uh, they'll pop you and it'll hurt and you might die uh, I believe this was in our biodiversity madness tournament, but I've forgotten. I don't remember I feel like it was I don't know if it won or not kind of funny if it didn't but anyway uh, so it's a good depends to make sure it doesn't get eaten. It's also a good way to, you know, eat some food. Uh, some of them get it at 10 feet in length, so like, this joker can have some surface area inside the ocean. So And, like, they can lose tentacles, so you can just be swimming and the next thing you know, owl. Uh, oh, I've hit my box jellyfish rogue tentacle. Um, it's amazing we go in the ocean. Even go outside, really, it's terrifying. Even inside's terrifying. You're going to have That's like going down that trap, uh, down that path. <laughs> it's terror. Uh, of animals in nature. It's always around. Uh, so these are one of the more dangerous creatures. It's also known as Sucker Punch because like you'll get hit and not know it. So like a Sucker Punch. Ha 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 uh, Only some of these individuals have been implicated in the human deaths, but still like, eh, enough's enough. You can see their uh, nidocytes down there in the bottom right. Sea wasps is extremely common in Australia, and that joker can kill you in a couple minutes. And so the issue is, like, you can be stung out in the ocean and can't get ashore, so you can't get the safety quick enough. And, like, it hurts. So there's videos um, of these. I think I put one in the thing so you can see it. If not, you should find one. I'll try and find one, maybe. Uh, where it talks about, like, the excruciating pain people go through, and you have to have, like, stay on this for a while to not, like, just want to die. Like, just excruciating pain. Uh, so it's pretty crazy. And so there's no evidence that peeing on somebody. Oh, this is a good tip. Don't pee on somebody if they've been stung by jellyfish. There's no evidence that it actually works. I'd be anecdotal, but that's not actual evidence. Uh, and so like meat tenderizer, lemon juice, not necessarily, um, actually help with that sort of thing. So do your own thing. Uh, try and find something that does work. Vinegar kind of works though. So maybe use a little vinegar. Uh, with that. You can't find this in Hawaii. Uh, and there is anti-venom, but like, it's, it, you have to get to it quick, that's the problem. Uh, and then this is a friend, so we have all these crazy jellyfish out in the ocean, right? Well, we have turtles that protect us, much like the Ninja Turtles protect us from forces of crime trying to take over New York, which only seems to be New York, which I guess is good, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, sea turtles, they'll go around and eat them, and you love sea turtles, right? Who doesn't love a cool sea turtle? I mean, you gotta love some jelly. Uh, so watch the video of that. Here's the thing about uh, just talking about some of the danger of jellyfish and some vinegar. It's kind of different stations, so I hate the smell of vinegar. So gross. Uh, but irukandji is a very deadly one. Uh, that thing is super small, but can still kill you. So like the the venom they can have in there can kill like multiple people. They have enough in them. So it's devastating. Uh, it actually got its name from a doctor who captured. The, uh, the specimen, uh, chronic flecker eye, that is, 
It got the name, the, the specific of that name, because of the doctor who captured it after he killed like a uh, five year old way back when. So crazy. Uh, so now we're near the end of Night Air. There's Owens. A lot of species here. Uh, these can be found in marine or freshwater. Uh, they're generally colonial organisms, and you can see the picture what they look like. That's kind of pretty on point with what they look at. Like. So you have these like kind of like tree-looking things coming up, and then you have like these little. Uh, this is a polyp stage, of course. And there's little uh, little segments on there, little polyps, little other sections of polyps, and so you can have some that are more for feeding, some for reproduction, and you can see the ones with that little tentacles coming off, obviously feeding. The other ones reproductive. Uh, and they can reproduce sexually or butt off. It was just like one of those things which just branch and fall off and just become another hydra elsewhere. Uh, again, no brain, no real muscles. Uh, they can have some things to sense light, which is cool, and can sense some touch, but overall kind of kind of mild. Uh, when conditions are poor, they reproduce sexually. Meanwhile, if it's great conditions, they reproduce asexually. Because things are going so great, let's have many of us to go around and grow. Meanwhile, conditions are poor, well, it's well. We gotta find something new to do. So let's mix up the genes and see what happens. We'll be better off and can grow and you know, you know, maybe develop a better form or something. Who knows? Um, but yeah, it's kind of unusual. Uh, so there's the polyps. You can see the feeding polyp and the reproductive polyp. Uh, it's kind of neat. Uh, here's a hydra themselves, and so hydra are actually kind of cool and they can kind of live forever. Uh, they've been shown experimentally in labs to just kind of live indefinitely, so I really can't kill them as much. It's kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, there's the shape of one. You'll see one in lab, a, slot, a picture of one. I know, I took the picture of it. See that. But check the video out for high. Uh, but yeah, so this ability uh, to regenerate and kind of live for a long time, not really eat or die. So this is obviously being studied to figure out, like, what is going on with this? Uh, it was somewhat controversial, but then like more and more evidence came out that showed they were doing it, and they have stem cells that have the ability for this to take place. And so much like the Marvel Hydra organization, where if you cut off one head, two more shall rise, and it seems to never go away, same deal with Hydras in real life. Like, they can regenerate, so if you cut off a head, no big deal. They don't really have a head anyway. Um, so, and then something else they'll do is they'll eat Cyclops, and so that's Cyclops in the top right, and so that's a Marvel character, of course, one of the leaders of the X-Men. And while these things will eat Cyclops on the bottom right, uh, which are the little, little things that's kind of float around and like, oh no, they get stung by the Hydra and die. And they get fed upon. So, Hydra wins. Uh, and this is the Hydra's own life cycle. So they have a Medusa and uh, Polyp stage as well. So they have both stages present, which is kind of unusual. So you can see the larval form that pops up and then the feeding Polyp. And then sometimes um, off their reductive end, a Medusa can form and it'll go around and float. And such a reproduction can take <laughs> Sorry about that, it can take place. Uh, and so, one of the last ones that comes up uh, is the thing about the Portuguese man of war. So, this thing, if you've seen this, it's like, oh, another jellyfish. But it's not really the same thing. It's not a medusa, it's a bunch of polyps of a hydra that come together and they just kind of specialize out heavily in this big massive form of like tons of different individuals floating together. Uh, it's very unnerving. Uh, they're responsible for a ton of stings in Australia. It can be very painful and you can see the whelps that can leave behind on your skin so it's not a great thing. Uh, it can lead to severe pain. Uh, the pain that usually goes away after a few hours but still, when I mean, you're in immense pain, you know, 20 minutes is a long time. They're obviously carnivores and then turtles, they eat them. So if you don't like them, Turtle friends help them out, so we do. It helps to have them around. But they came from the Atlantic Ocean. Who knows? Maybe I was stung by one. I don't remember. And so something else I can eat these things are blanket octopus shown there on the left. And so that has a unique thing to where it actually has this well, extreme blanket-like appearance to it. Uh, and so this is actually a female because this has extreme sexual dimorphism, where the males are extremely small, like just a few inches in length, and while the females can get you know. So it's pretty crazy, and they'll feed on the Portuguese man of war, and of course, the sea turtle. Uh, and so, last, a whole different phylum, but still jellies, is tenophores. These things are very different. Uh, they only have a medusa. They have they move by cilia, and so uh, that's very unusual. And so they just float around and capture prey. And so they don't really use stinging cells, but they use sticky cells. So what they'll do is they'll leash these things out, attached to a prey, 
and then just pull them back to the mouth and the prey can't get away because they're stuck. So it's a different solution to the same problem of prey capture. Uh, and so it's pretty unusual. So the cells they use for this are called caldoblast. So I just reach out, grab, and then just pull it in. And they're very quiet. Uh, uh, and so some of the largest known animals that use cilia to move, which is very unique. They, when, they, when the cilia move, they create rainbows of colors and be very, very pretty. Uh, even though one of them is called the sea walnut, it's actually on the bottom left. Uh, but they're very quiet when they move, and so if you see in the episode of The Office where Dwight and Andy are fighting, like at one point Andy's using this Prius because it's quiet to attack Dwight. That's how Tina Four is attacked. Same thing. Perfect metaphor uh, for what they do. Except Andy doesn't eat Dwight. But that would have been a fun episode if it did. Uh, but they reproduce sexually, but most are hermaphroditic, meaning they're male and female at the same time. Uh, or at least they have the parts for them at the same time uh, to reproduce in that way. So they produce eggs and sperm in the same organism. Uh, and so once they have all that stuff covered on their, their tentacles, they'll just kind of like wipe them across their mouth, which don't do now because you might get corona. Uh, but yeah, cool. Oh, uh, there was actually one that actually was introduced and caused a fishery crash back in the 80s. So just uh, bringing some of these things in can have some pretty severe consequences on the ecosystem life. And here's some examples, more examples of some Tina Fours, some very weird, unusual looking ones, but also really, really cool. Uh, and that's it, I think, for this one. So uh, that's it for Tina Fours. So make sure you check out the videos that go along with this. And